Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Morning. So, so Jovita, have you done a BIM webinar before? Or is this your first one? First BIM webinar. But you did a CAD one with me a while ago, right? Yeah. Where we uh, we basically turned a park in my neighborhood into a development. Wasn't that exciting? <laughs> I made some very large parcels. <laughs> Langley you, would be confused. <laughs> are you doing any uh, any similar thing this time around? No, I don't think I've got any Langley parcels this time. And Dave, I think, is this what our third BIM webinar you and I have done, or have you lost track? I kind of lost track after a while. But... Yes, and I see folks starting to uh, pour in, so uh, let us know in the chat where you're dialing in from. Uh, actually, Elizabeth, uh, this is, is this your first time hosting a webinar, or have you done a couple of these? Yeah, this is the first time I'm hosting a webinar from the beginning to the end, so I'm very excited to be helping behind the scenes today. Excellent, which means it also is your first BIM webinar. Yes, it is. <laughs> awesome. So is anybody uh, chatting with us in the chat about where they're from? Let's, Let's see. see. Not too many people. It's Andrea chiming in here. I'm going to be on the back end doing QA. So if you guys do have questions, I'll be back here. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Andrea. Oh, wow. We got somebody from Italy tuned in. That's wonderful. Oh, and I see uh, we have somebody from Safe Software tuned in. Thanks, Annabelle. Sweden. Yeah, we got a good international crowd. But uh, what do you think, folks? Is it time to get the show on the road? Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, we'll turn the cameras off. We will hang around at the end and put the cameras back on and uh, do some questions and answers. But uh, with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. If I can hit the right button and we will get going. So thanks everyone for tuning in this morning to our webinar on extending the value of BIM data part one. Uh, we're, we have an exciting set of topics we're going to discuss today and without further ado I'm going to get into introducing our panelists today. So my name is Dale Lutz. I'm a co-founder of Safe Software. We've been around for 26 plus years moving data of all kinds. Pretty excited to be sharing with you the results of a lot of that R&D today. And I'm joined today by Jovita. Hi, my name is Jovita Chan. I'm a desktop technology expert. Typically work with new users and onboarding with FME. So happy to be here today. Excellent, glad to have you Jovita and Dave. Hi, my name is Dave Campanis. I'm with the Strategic Experts team. We generally help uh, customers with uh, more complex projects or uh, proofs of concepts. Great, thank you so much for lending your time to us today. We um, think we got some great things to show. So we're gonna do a bit of an intro and we're gonna talk a bit about BIM in general. And then we're gonna look through a variety of customer scenarios, sprinkling in a couple of demos along the way. And lastly, I know that Jovita and Dave have curated a nice set of resources for those of you that wanna dig in further to look at. But I would be remiss in, if I didn't tell you that we're gonna have a part two of this webinar on November the 4th, which is, which I think will be a very boring morning. Everybody was gonna be hung over after staying up late the night before watching something or another, I have a feeling. So it could be a tough, a tough crowd on November the 4th, but um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be at it bright and early to talk about this in more detail. Today's webinar is gonna skim along the surface. We're gonna look at principles and concepts and kind of the, um, the what that can be done in terms of extending the value of BIM as opposed to much of the how. And when you come back and visit us on November the 4th, then we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper into the how, and we'll be focusing a bit more on some of the technologies that you're gonna see us talking about today. So today is kind of like the, the overview, and we're gonna be zooming in and, uh, and looking at things in more detail on November the 4th. And to that end, uh, we're gonna be hoping to learn from you to figure out what things we should zoom into. So when you're interacting with us today, please have that in mind that your input to us in the questions and so on will be helping us figure out the agenda for the part two. Okay, whoa, it's a flash demo already. Uh, so I'm gonna tell a little story and we're gonna take a little look at one example 
uh, that actually is very uh, close to home here, literally, uh, for myself. So even as I speak right now, that was taken not this morning, but yesterday, uh, they're building a barn down at the, um, in, our, in our bigger kind of acreage here. So we've got a, a barn coming and it's underway. And um, we, of course, have ourselves a Revit model of that barn that uh, Andrea was kind enough to fire up. I'm running on a Mac, so I can't run Revit myself, but this is what that barn is, is gonna look like eventually. And so uh, I was thinking to myself, I got this fine Revit model. <clears throat> what if I wanted to start to figure out, for example, what kind of windows do we need to order and how many of them? And so uh, I got the Revit model here and I'm just gonna hop over to um, my finder. And here is that Lutz Barn Revit model. And I've got my FME workbench sitting here. That's uh, the product that we make and, uh, and sell and we'll be using is our demos today. I'm just gonna drag that Revit model on here and add it. And with any luck, it pops up. And here are the various categories in that model. I am only gonna grab the, actually I'm gonna be ambitious. I'm gonna grab the doors and I'm gonna grab the windows. Okay, so I got two things to add to my workflow. And now I've got these and I can see that they have all kinds of properties. Um, I can go and make sure that I've got what's called feature caching on and then go ahead and run this and it'll go out to the, that file and um, here we go. And there we go, I can see my windows. And in fact, down here, I have a 3D view. Let me just make this a bit bigger. So you can see the, the windows that I've got. If I wanna drag these around, yeah, okay, it looks believable um, from what I remember. And then I've got all these attributes here, all these properties of these windows. Um, I think in here is like the, the glazing and other kinds of stuff, the size. Yeah, there's, there's the sizes. And so what I wanted to do, uh, because really data just loves getting itself into a spreadsheet. I thought I would make myself an Excel spreadsheet this morning. Um, let's see, we'll call it doors and windows. All right. And I'm going to copy the um, sheet definitions from my reader. Yep. So let's select these all and let that go. Okay. And now I got to drag these guys a bit over here so I can match them up to their friends. So I'm going to drag the doors over to the doors and the windows over to the windows. And if I wanted to, I could go and delete some of these columns. Um, I'm just going to let it go right now. So I'm just going to run this thing to the end. And there it goes. And now I'm going to pop open the uh, folder where this is and there's doors and windows. And just so you believe me, um, it was today at 807, which is probably believable. And I'll fire up Excel and we'll take a look. And then I can figure out how many windows I need to order. Yeah, thank you, Dropbox. So it looks like I have 12 windows in this house and, um, and I can see their properties and dimensions and a variety of other things. And so just like that, I've managed to extract some value, even without me knowing much about uh, architecture or building models, I've got something that I can now use. And so this workflow I've created using Workbench, I could now save and I could run this every time I change the model. In fact, I could run it manually or I could push it up to a server product where it would run automatically each time the model changed. So. Let's go back to look at this. And yeah, that was my that was my quick demo. So one of our customers that, that piped up in our user community, you can read his quote there, that he was able to do the kind of thing I've just shown, extracting value out of Revit and doing cost estimation very, very quickly by piecing together the quantities coming out of the, uh, the data coming out into the workflow. So David Rasner uh, would love to talk more with you. Uh, hopefully you see this someday and know that uh, you were using your quote. So just to step back a little bit, who in the world are we and why would we do, we do something like this? We are Safe Software. We started back in 93 with a mission to, max, to help back then the forest companies and the government exchange information. And over time, we honed our mission 
to help organizations of all kinds maximize the value of the data that they have. And that has taken us to a lot of different corners of the places where data lives. But the place we're talking about today is building information models, which are an absolute gold mine of data. We do have three different products that we make. FMA Desktop is what I just showed, where you can build and run these workflows. You can run them ad hoc, um, refine them. Once you've got them going, you can pop them up to FME Server, where they will run hands-free while you sleep in response to um, some kind of an input or a person clicking on a form or clicking on a mobile app or a file arriving in a directory. That's what FME Server is all about. And FME Cloud is just FME Server, where you pay by the hour. Our products are available to buy uh, you know, up front, or you can do subscriptions as well. And especially if you're municipalities, um, we have some great subscription offerings. So what is this BIM we're speaking about? According to Wikipedia, and you can read the uh, definition there, it's really a complete digital model of everything in a building, often created before the building is made. But the real key and value comes afterwards when that model can be used to help maintain the building and, uh, and keep it operating. I think I read somewhere once that the expense of a building is one-tenth of it is actually creating it and its lifetime 10 times more spent uh, afterwards. And so it is a very key thing to be able to leverage this information. And BIM is, BIM is very complex. And so the question we ask our customers or the, really they say to us is that they don't feel that they are using BIM data to its full potential and they would like to be getting more value out of it than, uh, than just drawings. And so I wanna invite you to a chat storm right now. Tell us, what do you find to be your biggest challenge when interacting with your BIM data? So go ahead into the question panel and uh, chat storm us. And I'm gonna put uh, one of my teammates here on the hook to, um, to uh, see if, uh, Anyone will answer. Boy, Dave, are any, is anybody chiming in about their BIM challenges? Um, <laughs> not quite yet. We'll give them a few minutes. It takes a while to type. I think the BIM challenges are maybe a bit um, a bit longer to type. No, I so, think so. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to move ahead to a couple of slides, and then we'll look back and see if anybody uh, chimed in. So. We think that there's a lot of ways that our customers have told us that they can make use of BIM data over and above just producing the drawings. And actually, in my own case with that fancy Revit model for the barn down there, when I, when I go down there and watch the guys working, guess what they're using? Great big plots of drawings. They're only looking at 2D views of it. And, uh, and really, that's about it. So there's, and I don't think my, my work site is that unique. So the idea is you can, make ring more value out of this BIM data to share it, to analyze it, to put it into other formats to do things with it. And these are the kinds of things we're going to be showing today. Uh, we think that there's value when you can transform it. I think, Dave, you even have an example where you're integrating some BIM with other stuff, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so that's okay. that's uh, that's worth worth keeping in mind and watching for later today. I don't think we're going to be showing it, but of course, using the tools we've got, you could validate that the BIM model is complete, that it's not missing attributes. Um, we can even do geometry validations and so on. And then of course, lastly, we can automate BIM workflows so that while you're sleeping or when things update, stuff just happens. So really our goal is to enable your BIM data to be used in more places, in more ways by more people. And we really hope that by the time you finish this webinar with us today, that's what you're going to take home. So, uh, Dave, I think there was a, a, a flurry of action. What would you, uh, how would you summarize it all? <laughs> uh, biggest thing seems to be complexity. Uh, BIM data is very complex and you just want to uh, extract some of it. Uh, yeah. We also have uh, challenges of georeferencing it because most BIM data is not georeferenced. And I think uh, they'll be happy with some of the examples we're showing. And the other one I saw is uh, tying together with other applications. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, extract BIM data to 2D floor plan lines. Ooh, we'll make them happy as well. So a little bit of foreshadowing going on here. Excellent. But, uh, yeah. Wonderful. You know, I did see someone use the word mash, and I was just talking earlier about how we're creeping up close to Halloween, and that makes me think of Monster Mash, Dave. 
Oh, well, you can tell we're the same age because that's the same thought that came to my mind, but I think it might be lost on some of the youngins. Yes, but that will be for another day. Maybe we'll do that. We'll have to pay homage to that in our part two. So anyway, thanks everyone for the excellent um, inputs there. Oh, someone wants to extract the outer skin. Um, and that's a great BIM example as well for, for use. And we definitely have things for that. So uh, I think with this, we're ready for another demo and I'm gonna hand it over. I think Jovita, are you up? I am. All right. All right, so we've got a few demos for you guys today. And unlike the last time you saw this demo screen, I'm not going straight into Workbench, but I will be showing you the workflow and what we're looking at. So right now I've got a couple of 2D cases for you guys in extracting BIM, and then we're gonna go and look at more 3D things and Dave will take you into more complex workflows. So this first one is on cost estimation on quantities. David Rasner has already done this, so I decided to try my hand at it as well. And I imagine being able to grab just what, you, just what you want, such as just the doors or the windows, to be able to calculate the cost per type would be really useful. And to be able to update costs as they change in a way that doesn't make you have to go in manually and change all the costs per type. So let's go into the workflow and take a look at that. So in this, Workspace, I'm focusing just on Windows, similarly to what Dale was doing. So already, I'm taking this whole Revit file and I'm just selecting the window category to read in, and that already filters through a lot of my data and that I'm only looking at what I need. In the blue bookmark, I'm calculating quantities, then I'm doing some statistics so I can create a pie chart in Excel as well. For those of you who have used FME and you see that red on my writer, that's intentional and I do have a formula in Excel, which is why you see the red there. This is my result for Windows cost estimation. The top screenshot you see is in Tableau, so I can write straight to Tableau if I desire. And then I can also write to Excel. And that's my chart there looking at the proportional cost of each window type per the total cost. So you can get a quick glance and send that to whoever needs that and update it as you go. And okay. I am sorry after um, changing presenters, but uh, after my screen's changing, we're going to move to Dave. Okay, uh, yeah, Jovita showed us how to extract the Revit information to Excel. Uh, another thing we can do for this, this same information is we can use it to populate an asset management database. In this case, uh, Maximo. Uh, so we have a we're, we're reading from the Revit and we're using the Maximo Object Creator, which is a uh, one of a series of transformers you can find on the FME Hub that communicates with uh, the Maximo product. And uh, again, I'm not going to show you the workspace, but using the, using these tools, you can uh, take all of the Revit information on all the assets and plug it right into Maximo. So you don't have to you don't have to key everything in by hand. Oops. Uh, the other one thing uh, that is useful is uh, extracting floor plans from Revit. And so we're now we're moving a bit into graphical realm. Uh, in this case, we want to extract 2D floor plans from Revit. Now, Revit will already ex export uh, floor plans if you export to a DWG file. But the problem there is that it just gives you the line work and it doesn't give you any of the, uh, the property information on, that, on those lines, which might be uh, quite useful uh, when, you're, when you're working with it. So what we're going to do is just show you how we can extract the, the floor plans uh, from from Revit. And there's a, there's when you when you read in the Revit data on the, the file settings, um, and we'll go into more detail on this on the second webinar. But there's an option to read the views directly from the views to Revit, and you can read, if you read a 2D view, you'll basically get 2D data. And if you uh, export that to say AutoCAD, you'll get what we see here. Okay, it's showing correctly. So we've got the, the, the 2D lines, but if we, quick, if we click on the lines, we'll see that we have retained here all of the information from Revit. Kobe, all, all of those extra properties from Revit have come through are now in the CAD file as well. In this case, I'm using AutoCAD Map because it has the, the, the capacity to store attributes, but you could also go to regular AutoCAD if you set it to insert attributes or extended attributes. This was just easier to display. Okay, 
And I'm going to turn this back over to Jovita, and she's going to show you some uh, fun you can have with the 3D PDS or 3D uh, export. At the right screen this time. Thanks, Dave. So this one is going to 3D PDF. And I know Revit already has a export to PDF, but those are 2D. And workarounds I saw could be kind of lengthy to do. So this example looks at writing to 3D PDF and keeping all of that attribution data. So you're getting more than just pictures out of it. You have something that you can interact with, navigate, and be able to select and look at attribute information. So we're going to go take a look at that. This is my source data. Some of you may recognize this from Autodesk sample files. And this is the Rack Advanced Sample Project. On the left there, you can see all of the different feature types. We call them feature types in FME. And that's just a screenshot of the data inspector, which allows you to preview your data as you go. Um, it's also embedded in the an FME workbench as a visual previewer. So if you notice that you can see the image or the data displayed there, it's in desktop as well. So here I'm going from Revit to 3D PDF. And the part that I want to point out here is that I'm only grabbing the exterior of the Revit building, which I recall seeing in the comments when we had our chatter storm. So I'm excited to make somebody happy today. So we're just reading the Revit exterior. And that happens on read. There's a filter that you can set. Um, I believe there's also wireframes and all elements and a floor plan. So I've just grabbed the exterior shell. The transformers in the middle in that blue bookmark there are what manipulates my data further. So far, you've seen readers and writers. So these are my transformers that take the attribution from the Revit file and puts it onto the geometry as traits right out into my PDF. And this is a reminder for myself to go and to actually take a look at the PDF because then we can actually show it navigating. So since I've changed screens, I'm going to have to get out a full screen here so I can pull my PDF over. Make that full size. Move this over. So this here is my advanced sample. This is the wrong one, excuse me. This is the advanced sample. Got a preview there. And as you can see on the left side here, I've got a navigation tree. I can turn things on and off, so I can toggle layers. You could change the diff you could change and control what layers you want to have to be able to toggle. I'm gonna bring those back, and we can look at the different walls. I'm gonna turn the roofs back off. And as you can see there is all the attribution information. We can just click through a few more there. And just to show that this is in 3D, we can move this around. And I won't move it around too much in case anybody else is feeling dizzy. And I'm going to go back into the presentation now. I'll just leave it like that. So the next one is viewing space usage. We've looked at the exterior of the building. Now we want to look at the interior and what the rooms are actually for. To do that, we can use FME to create a 3D model of all the rooms and color them by their space usage so you can get a quick glance and we're going to make them translucent so we're going to lower the opacity and Dave calls these jelly cubes or jelly cube rooms I don't know if that's an actual term or if it's a Dave term but I like it and I'm going to use it so we're creating jelly cubes now and this is also outputting to 3d pdf so here's my space usage jelly cubes I'm reading just the rooms and if you see in that green bookmark there and you recognize those transformers, it's exactly the same as the other one going from PDF, or sorry, going from Revit to PDF, where we grab those attributes and we're putting it on the geometry. Then in the yellow bookmark, we're coloring spaces by room name and then writing it out. As I mentioned in the navigation tree, we could name those layers. I've named them by room name and number. And my lovely reminder to go into PDF. So that was the one you guys kind of saw but hopefully not too closely, because that would be spoilers. So just to show, I can rotate this around. And then I can also select different things in this model. So that's an instructional room. I'd expect all these other green ones to be instructional as well, and they are. I've got my lobby. I'm going to double click that. There we go, lobby. And attribute information. So this is kind of exciting to be able to share with somebody to be, know that you're talking about the same room. And Dave will show later a example, a more specific example of why you might want to use Jelly Cubes to view your assets. And back into 
here. And I'll be passing this back to Dave now. Okay, yeah, an example of the sort of jelly cubes in uh, use, and I was I was quite gratified to see this since I, I wrote the article on how to do this about nine years ago. Um, Skipple Airport um, uses it to sort of as a basic uh, sort of space planning overview uh, uh, view, uh, and you can see the uh, example of a screenshot here. So it's 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 quick, it's simple, it it uh, has fairly high performance. Um, and it just gives people a, a good representation of what you know parts of the the airport are being used for. Let's advance. Okay, another another use of uh, uh, Acrobat's 3D mode is, um, and again, this is this is a blue sky for me. But I always thought it would be kind of useful, especially since I'm doing a lot of renos around my house, and I really like to know where my pipes are and stuff. Um, is you can take the, uh, the the infrastructure that's in Revit and we can create a 3D model to um, display that based on uh, on each room. So let me just scoot over here. So here's an example where I've taken the uh, the rooms from the Revit and the pipes and also the ceilings because uh, we want to see what's what's underneath the ceiling as well. And uh, I've just made a, a quick model here. But the cool thing about this is we can go in and say we're going to be working on the bathroom. We can, first of all, let's turn off all the rooms. And then we can just uh, go to the bathroom, turn that one on. So if we click on this, we see, uh, yep, man, men's toilet. Good, that's the one we want. We just right click on this, we can go zoom the part. And now we see the, the room as it is there. We see the, the, the ceilings here and we see all the pipes. So these are all, most of these pipes are beneath the floor or, or behind the wall, et cetera. So normally they wouldn't be easily viewed uh, when you actually get to the room. Um, but you can see them quite quickly and get an idea proportionally where they sit and where they lie. Um, normally you'd have to do this off of like 2D plans and that takes somebody, you know, who's used to reading plans and can sort of visualize things. Well, this kind of, this kind of takes all the, all the guesswork out of it. You, you can see everything. And like anything else uh, in, the, in the Acrobat, you can, let's, let's, uh, Try clicking on a pipe here. There we go. And we can also see that we brought in all the information about that pipe. Uh, so you can click on the pipes and see like what they are, what their sizes are, and what you need to, to work on them. So that's a quick uh, 3D example. But you know what would be even cooler than that would be to, if you could do that, yeah, you do that, and actually you know, see it on the spot. Now, this again is a bit of a blue sky one, but uh, uh, my colleague Dimitri did a webinar um, uh, a little while ago on using the, the FME AR app and how to take 3D models and, and bring them into AR and view them on your on your device, your phone, and use them. And one of his examples was to see, you know, infrastructure under the ground, which quite to my mind is the most useful thing because that's something you don't normally see. So you can walk around and sort of view the infrastructure under the ground. We, we, it would really be kind of cool to do that um, inside the, the, the building as well. Um, the problem you have with that is that once you leave, once once you go into the building, you kind of lose your GPS on your phones. So you, but you need the locational information because otherwise it's you know really hard to get your 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 AR all registered in in the in the room, and you don't want to do that all the time. You want to be able to just walk through and 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 have it follow you. So the solution to that would be to, to enable indoor positioning. Now, uh, the easiest way to indoor, or that we've known to do indoor positioning is to, is to use the uh, Apple's location services. And this is basically, it's an extension of Apple Maps that, uh, that allows you to sort of submit your, your own floor plans or your own uh, building information to Apple and do a survey. And they will, um, they will, they will create uh, they will take that location information you, you you take and basically plug into Apple Maps. So the process for this is the first thing you want to do is you want to create this Apple indoor IMDF file. So that's that's the Apple Maps indoor mapping uh, format. Um, we write to this in, in FME and we have uh, quite a few examples on how to create these files. Um, once you've created the file, you will submit it to Apple. And they will, you know, check it, uh, check it to make sure it's good and everything. And then um, they will uh, check it into their system. 
The next step is to get their indoor survey app, and this just runs on your uh, iPhone. And then you wander around your building and you do a survey. And what it's doing is it's surveying all the, the Wi-Fi transceivers um, in your building. And it's building up kind of like a, a virtual constellation. So it's kind of like indoor GPS. And once that survey is done, you can then create your, your FME AR file, your augmented reality file, which runs in the FME AR app. And now that you're, you're, you've got the uh, location services enabled, it's really easy to sort of register your AR when you, when you wander into the building. So then you can wander around and see all your pipes in real time, which would be really, really handy, I think. Oh, we've got a bonus slide, cool. Yes, this is an example of that barn that Dimitri, looks like I got Tesla's growing in the, in the barn, but um, going Revit to FME AR, this was just recently done and you can have uh, sort of jump points and then walk around and see it. Um, you can see we've got a really rough barn planned for the top floor. But, um, but anyway, it's just another way of, uh, as Autodesk used to say, experience it before it's real. And, uh, and AR is certainly a great tool for doing that. Definitely, definitely. I want one of those of my house really badly. <laughs> yes. That was an iPad that Dimitri would have been walking around with and then recording the screen in his uh, neighborhood. Yeah, cool. Now, the one the one snag in this process is that um, to bring your your BIM information into into uh, the Apple Maps is that you really need to have it geolocated. And a, and a lot of BIM data, I mean, the 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 the, the tools kind of exist within, I believe, Revit and um, and IFC to geolocate your data, but a lot of people just don't do it. So most of the BIM files you're going to see are not geolocated in any way. Um, but after working on this a little bit, I've sort of come up with a technique that uh, is is quite easy and useful to um, do the geolocating uh, in the, as part of your FME uh, conversion. And basically what we're going to do is we're using FME's ability to create a local coordinate system. And that's basically an azimuthal equal area coordinate system sort of centered around a, a point on the earth. And within like about a I don't know, like 20, 30 kilometers. Um, it is, a, it has no, it's a coordinate system, that, a projected coordinate system that basically has effectively no distortion. So it works good for small uh, BIM models. Um, but once you, you have the data in this coordinate system and that can be reprojected uh, in 3D to any other coordinate system that you want to you wanna supply the data in, whether it's Web Mercator or a state plane, et cetera. So, oops, touchy mouse. Okay. So the, 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 the technique basically has three transformers and it and requires uh, six parameters. We need a, a, an X and Y of the reference point within the, the Revit model. And that would be in the, in, the, in the Revit units. We need the lat long of that same reference point. Um, and we also need the uh, rotation angle of the, uh, the building to true north. And then the units within your, your, your Revit file. So the first three of those can be uh, derived from Revit, the, the X, Y, and the, and the units. And then for the, the lat, long, and angle, generally what I do is if it's an existing building, as I throw up, Google, I just look it up in Google Earth. And from there, you can get the, the lat, long to, uh, I think down to about a meter or a tenth of a meter, um, which is usually close enough, and you can measure the rotation angle. So in, in, pro, in I guess in, in usage, it takes about five minutes to do this. So it's a really sort of quick and easy way of getting the, the georeference working. Okay, now the next thing we're gonna talk about is supplementing BIM data. So sometimes your, 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 your BIM data is tied to an external database or you're, you're using an external application with, with the BIM. Um, in this case, um, we're working with uh, Tririga, which is a IBM facilities management uh, system. It has a product called the uh, Tririga a BIM integrator, which allows you to sort of integrate your Revit file in Tririga, and they're they're now you know talking to each other. Well, it would be really nice to sort of use that mechanism they use to talk to each other when we're extracting the data, so we can grab the data from both Tririga and Revit. Say if we're going into something like ArcGIS Indoors, which has a sort of space management tool as well, which needs the you know the, the people information as well as the the building information. So using FME, we can, we can read the uh, specific properties in Revit that the, the integ BIM integrator sets. Um, we can use those uh, parameters and then we can then communicate through a, a custom transformer called the Tririga Record Fetcher, which is not yet published on the hub, but will, should be shortly. 
um, that communicates with the TriRiga database through its API and just gets that information back. And then, then, they, then the data is all merged together and output to uh, Arctis indoors. So Dave, just before you hop past that one, that's an yeah. example of, of kind of merging or integrating data from different sources. And I just, I warned you, I was going to chime in on this one because oh, I think yeah. we got a webinar coming up, I think next week, but Elizabeth can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, we've got a webinar coming up about all the different ways FME can bring merge data from different places uh, for augmentation purposes. And I think this is a really interesting and non-standard, uh, not the usual beaten path, but a, a one that has a, a lot of value and we can bring from these quite different systems and merge together. Yeah, yes, and that's correct. That's Sorry, that's what I said. Yeah, that's one of the main strengths of, of, of FME is the ability to merge uh, from a bunch of different data sources. And, and in a way, you're almost creating new data through the, this merging because you end up with a, a greater understanding of, uh, of the situation than you, than you would get from just the, the, the two data sources on their own. Yeah, and I've just uh, chatted out the link to that webinar. Um, if you do have any questions on merging and joining, be sure to tune in next week with us. Cool. So there's more to the BIM world than just Revit. I know we've, we've done a lot of Revit recently and we're really proud of our Revit reader, but um, we also support the uh, IFC standard. And the neat thing about IFC is that it's an open standard for BIM. So if, if you're, you're in a situation where open standards or open data is required, uh, IFC kind of suits that, um, that need. Um, we can read both the, the, the traditional step version of IFC and the new IFC XML. Um, we can write to the traditional step version. So this is the, we can't write to Revit yet. We can say read only, but we, with IFC, you can actually update your, your BIM data. Uh, if you want to merge in information from other sources or you want to do, do some updates. Um, we are keeping current with our IFC. We support the IFC, uh, upcoming IFC 4.3 standard already in the betas. And we're we're keeping uh, keeping in touch with Building Smart to make sure we're we're always up to date on this information. So just an example of uh, how IFC is used with FME. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Schiphol Airports, um, how they maintain their, their their sort of digital twin database. So Schiphol has created a, a digital twin of their entire airport. Uh, from a bunch of different uh, sources of information, and they call this the CDE, which I'm thinking stands for Common Data Environment. Um, but this 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 data model is constantly being uh, updated because Schiphol itself is it's a large airport, and they're constantly doing renovations and changes and everything. So they had to find a mechanism for for updating this digital twin to keep it uh, aligned with the actual airport itself. So yeah, what they have is the the the, the BIM model has been given to to Schiphol, um, and each each part of the airport, each feature, each sort of asset has its own unique ID. And this 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 information is transmitted through um, IFC XML. But instead of giving you a whole file uh, of IFC XML, what they do is they have they've broken it up into messages. So they have a they have this message where each asset or each feature is its own little uh, piece of XML and XML message, and those get transmitted to the airport service bus. Now in, at the back end, FME is running actually data interrupt, but it is running uh, as part of this airport service bus, and that's what's sort of communicating with their with their database and and doing all the updates. Um, not sure if it's in real time, but it's it's close to real time. Uh, and again, if any any contractors make changes to the the um, the model, those those changes. So just the change is, is sent as an XML message and used to uh, update the, the database. So we can see an example here. So the contractor has made an update. He has a little send IFC button within Revit that, that exports the the IFC message. That gets sent to uh, through the process, and we can see this uh, little wall has been added in automatically to the 3D model. Okay, we've talked about Revit, we've talked about IFC; those are kind of the core BIM. But there are also kind of other formats that are are, are kind of BIM adjacent or, or BIM light, if you will. Um, one of them is indoor mapping. This is quite popular recently, or at least appears to me since I've been doing a lot of work on it. But um, this is a way of bringing the sort of mapping in inside buildings, major buildings like airports and malls, et cetera. But you can also use it within your own with your own business campuses. 
etc. We went through an example of how to sort of do a basic IMDF creation uh, before. But there's kind of three basic types of indoor mapping. Um, the representation of the first type is, is Apple Maps IMDF. It's an open standard, it's all GeoJSON, but it has very strict business rules on, on how you have to construct your data. And it's also kind of limited in the information you can store in your data because it's, it's not open. There's, there's certain types of information, there's certain values that, that information would be. So you're really reliant upon Apple updating their specs. Uh, um, you know to, to hold that, that information and it's it's essentially it's a format that's designed to be displayed in apple maps that's that's its core purpose and that's that's kind of what it's designed around and so it has sort of limitations for that um, the next type of indoor map is arcgis indoors and that's uh, that's their new indoor mapping system it, it runs with arcgis pro it's designed for as a data repository. It's designed for you to store your data in, to modify your data in. It, it's it's the database of, of records. So you can use it, uh, you know, just to to as your sort of core database. Um, the one the one downside to it is that um, it's a proprietary system. So you you are tied to ArcGIS in uh, Pro to to use ArcGIS indoors. And lastly, we have indoor GML, and this is a, a an open standard again. It's it's based on XML. Um, it's designed for data transfer, so you can it's it's flexible. You can represent uh, almost any type of indoor data, but it's designed to to move data from application to application. It's not something it's not a database you'd set up for querying. So um, we're also keeping an eye on uh, you know sort of future formats coming down the road, and there seem to be a, a lot of them um, as people are you know moving the, a lot of this. Uh, GIM data and tying it to infrastructure, et cetera. I um, already mentioned IFC 4x3, which is you know still in development, but we're, we've, up, we, we've updated FME the latest beta so it can read uh, at least the latest iteration of, of 4x3. Um, there's City JSON, which is kind of like a light version of City GML uh, based on JSON. That's really kind of useful as a data model for digital twins. Um, it's, it's, it's very flexible. You can, you can describe a lot of things in it, but at the same time, it's all in JSON, so most applications, or it's easier to, 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 to read it in any application. Um, there's the GeoBIM extension to CityGML. Um, this is designed to sort of you know, merge the BIM and the GIS worlds together. And then finally, there's MUDDY, which is um, a kind of initiative for uh, underground infrastructure. So they're trying to build standards around underground infrastructure and on how the data can be um, sent back and forth between applications. And uh, I mean, there are other st standards like COBE and so forth. And we try to keep, uh, uh, you know, keep an eye on these standards and try to make sure we support them as they come out. Um, Dave, yes? Dave I'll just, uh, I noticed some of the customers or the viewers today were pointing out that uh, BIM is more than just buildings. And your first point uh, definitely highlights that, that the same techniques and technology are being used to try to really model infrastructure more generally rather than just building. So that's kind of an expanding frontier. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's the key, yeah, and, and that is the key between behind IFC of 4X3. They're, they're, they're bringing the BIM outside the building uh, into the civil 3D realm. Um, and yeah, right now it's ports, waterways, and road. And then I think 4X4, they're, they're gonna be working on that, bringing the railway information. So ultimately it's, it's uh, and I think basically what format you're gonna end up using depends on, I guess, what sort of granularity you want on your data. So you can go for the, 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 the sort of BIM level of granularity where you know incredible amounts of information about absolutely everything, or you can go for the lighter models like CityJSON or, or, or CityGML, which are, are basically for viewing and more of a, a infrastructure level uh, or planning level uh type of type of uh information but the cool thing is is that you can by using fme's filtering capabilities uh and merging capabilities you can actually you know bounce around from the between these different levels by you know either collating the data into the higher uh levels of information or ex extracting just the the limited uh levels of information you need so i think there's a there's a lot of promise there um, i'll also just ask the audience if any of them are following ifc we've started to appear on our radar IFC version 5 and um, just curious how many of you out there have heard of that and uh, see a future for that in your own work. Uh, we do intend we're starting to take steps so that we're ready to support it but from what we gather it's still measured in years to to get to. 
Okay, I'll pass it back to you, Dale, to do the wrap up. You know what, Dave, I'll let you keep the slides and I'll just ask you to advance. So we, we do have uh, quite a bit of time left. It's not it's unlike us to be uh, early like this, but we wanted to give a survey of a whole bunch of different areas. And uh, based on what you've seen today, please chime in on the chats to let us know what areas you'd like us to dig into and show you more next time when we come back. We can get more into the how uh, rather than just the, the what. So um, yeah, we hope, Dave, going to the next slide, we hope that um, you'll have seen that there's a lot that can be done with BIM data. And I've really enjoyed the, the conversation that's been going on in the questions and answers. Thanks so much, everybody, for, for chiming in and also the panelists at SAFE for answering lots of great questions. We'll look into them in a, in a second. But you can get a sense from what we showed today that it is possible to wring out and squeeze some very interesting outputs, whether it's like Jovita showed at the beginning, something like Tableau, and incidentally, Jovita, I should get you to help me estimate the cost of that barn before we get too far down the project. But um, but having a Tableau de type dashboard coming out of BIM is pretty uh, interesting, all the way to some of the more interesting kinds of integrations with things like Tririga on the facility side and, and so on. Airports, of course, floor, indoor mapping, augmented reality, quite a lot of destinations for BIM data. Yeah, I guess you can say we go all the way from uh, writing BIM data to Excel, and on the other end of the spectrum, something like um, something like augmented reality. So, so the whole gamut is is possible. So we hope we've inspired you to do more, and we love to know more about the kind of challenges you face and uh, and how we can help with them. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Dave. So there's just a bunch of resources uh, coming up or on demand, and I think these when we post these. Um, we'll have the links in there for you, or maybe Elizabeth will be sending out some of the links right now so you can register to some of these things. So, um, yeah, the, the data integration between different uh, inputs we highlighted. Uh, we did do that FMEAR webinar just recently that if that's something of interest to you, you can take a look on our website, safe.com slash webinars. It's in the archive, or maybe Elizabeth will zing that out. Um, but otherwise, join us in a couple of weeks. Wow, November the 4th is pretty quick and um, we'll be doing part two. So Jovita and Dave, have you got all your demos ready yet? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good, I like that confident uh, answer. Haven't heard from Jovita. But... You'll be seeing Andrea in part two. Oh, okay, so she's th handing the torch over to Andrea. And so then Jovita will be back there answering questions probably where Andrea was today. Absolutely. Okay, let's get the next slide, Dave. I would say that BIM as a general topic is among the more complex things that FME deals with. Is that fair to say, Jovita and Dave? Definitely. Yeah, and so over the years, um, we've tried to create various resources that can help you get started. Uh, so there's three of them there to, um, to take a, a peek at. And uh, of course, our training is always free, and so you can hop onto safe.com and look for the training and, and take it on demand when you want to kind of build up your, your base level of understanding of how to manipulate data. But uh, we really try hard to provide tools that make these, frankly, quite complex scenarios as easy as we can, and we're always learning and trying to do better, so we appreciate your feedback as well. So. So anyway, here's a couple of other uh, links. And I know Elizabeth will be sending these slides out to everybody in the next day or two. So all these links will be available for you there as well. So I think with that, we'll hop to uh, general questions and answers. And I'm going to put Andrea on the spot. Uh, Andrea, is there any um, themes you saw or anything you'd like to highlight from the Q&A that went by? Hmm. Um, no questions are coming to mind other than I know a lot of people are saying that BIM data is super complex. Um, uh, just trying to, to see. There's been a lot of chatter happening. I, I will address Lubomar um, was sort of stunned at how fast my um, interaction with my barn Revit model was. And I will reveal the secret. Um, Matthew's on the on the line in the, the developer that did that work, Matthew and Aiden and the rest of that team. But I think Matthew was the persistent cash guy. So 
Revit is a very slow thing to read in FME. It's a massive file. There's lots of parts to it. And so what we did was uh, we build a cache, basically. I, I don't remember if I have to turn this on explicitly. Matthew can tell us. But if you're reading Revit, the first time we'll go through and grind through and, and kind of figure it all out. And then if you open that same thing a second time, it'll be basically instant. We'll have remembered what we had. And we just look at the file dates to figure out if our cache is stale or not. But uh, I'm not sure if Matthew has a mic. I didn't ask him ahead of time, but um, is there anything else you want to say about that caching on Revit? As of modern FMEs, caching is enabled by default. So simply reading a Revit file will build those caches and any subsequent reads should be sped up quite drastically. Yeah, it's it's stunning. Like I, I actually used it for the first time when I was prepping these demos and I was blown away. Um, Matthew, did that come in in which 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 FME? Do you know 2020.0 or 2020.1? I believe 2020.1. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, but anyway, if if you grab the latest, the the most recent release, it's there. And I know we talked about the how long the cache um, lives. Do you recall? Is it by default? Is it a week or how long does it live live around? There's a reader parameter that'll allow you to control that, and by default, that's set to 14 days. Okay. Uh, the cache weeks. will be updated as you change your settings, so you'll have new caches as you tune your settings to exactly what you want. Right. So if you choose to read the exterior shell, you'll get one cache for that. If you go back in there and say, no, I want the floor plans, it'll have to make another cache for that. And lastly... Yeah. Uh, if you, if you have a bunch of Revit files you're going to work with, you could write a, kind of a batch FME script that just read them all and, and run that overnight. Uh, you know, use the star.rvt and with the settings you want, read them all, and then the, the next day it should uh, all be instant. So that's um, something if those of you who work with big ones, big amounts might want to do. So anyway, that's a little detour on that. Um, I know that there were people asking about floor plans and um, between uh, the, all the folks here, we, we can read floor plans out of Revit, but will there be lines across the doorways or are the doorways open by default? Do you, does anybody know? Nobody knows. Not too sure. I, I would uh, default to Dave since Dave's on the, uh, he's big with doing uh, floor plan reading. Um, the, yeah, and the floor plan, it's basically, it's the, we, we're capturing the symbol from Revit. So um, it's, it's, the, it's the 2D symbol supplied by Revit, but it gives you the, the, the jam um, sort of outline as well as the door sweep angle. Right, so the door, should, you should be able to remove the door opening and have it be sitting there open, I think. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Uh oh, Dave's locked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing that I was going to mention that I saw uh, people were asking about was the exterior shell reading only. Um, and there is a parameter in the Revit reader that allows you to only read the exterior shell. So if you have a Revit file, I would suggest trying the Revit reader um, and select uh, the exterior shell only for the elements to read. So it's just looking at the door symbols here, and it doesn't appear to have a line across the opening. So right. if you just wanted a simple line across the opening, um, and actually that's something that comes up when you if you're going into um, Apple indoor mapping. Um, there are different ways I've tried. I've I've, I've sort of tried to do it. Um, one is to uh, one is to sort of take the arc and assume that it's always in the same direction and using the arc uh, uh, parameters. You can calculate that line. But quite frankly, the easiest one I found was just to read the 3D view instead, which and then take a, a bounding box of the uh, the actual door yes. uh, itself, uh, its footprint, and then just use that to clip the the wall line. Yes. So so yeah. that's a radical thing because you could read in the same workspace, you can read the same Revit model, one in with the floor plan, one with the 3D model, and then integrate it and do wacky things like Dave is just saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Our our webinar actually back in March when we were uh, showing off 2020, uh, one of the demos in there uh, was reading in the 3D Revit model and creating a 2D floor plan from that. And um, 
it was extract kind of extracting out the door areas as well so uh, that might be something to check out too right I'll so we, the link in the chat good for that webinar. Yeah, we'll that link for that, that uh, i forgot about that webinar we did um, six months ago or so <laughs> yep was that during COVID already or not do you remember andrea it, it was our first one yeah okay wow cool let's see Somebody asked if they can store BIM geometry in a traditional database for quick retrieval. And yes, we have customers that take these BIM things and then huck them into databases like MongoDB or others. Depends how structured or not you want to get, but you absolutely can do that. Dave, in your experience, have you seen people taking geometries and hucking them into databases for in the BIM world as much or not as much? Um, I, I, got, I know it's been a lot of talk about it, and uh, there, there have been uh, you know the, the 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 BIM database and BIM DB and stuff. I actually haven't seen it in person. I must I must be honest right. with you. But I know it's been people have been talking for about it for at least 12 or 13 years now. Um, right. I guess technically, I mean, IFC is essentially a highly normalized relational database in a in a file format. So you could probably dump yeah. that straight into uh, uh, like Oracle or or SQL Server or something, and just build your own tools to access it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really with as with many things, you're only limited by your imagination. I should ask if people on this call uh, have heard of a thing called Speckle. Anybody know about that open source Speckle thing, which is for um, helping to manage building information? I think it uses a database in the back, and it can coordinate between a variety of different softwares, um, all the way from Excel to to Revit, and um, and also it has a web viewer and other things uh, along those lines too. And I, I also wonder, does anybody on this call care about Rhino? Uh, we've had some folks ask us about, actually, and also Navisworks. So um, those are a couple of things. If, if Rhino or Navisworks are things that would be helpful to your, um, your workflows, please let us know and we can add you to the list as we contemplate what we're going to do there. It turns out that we there's the Rhino uh, format is and is specified in an open source library called Open NURBS that FME has used for more than 20 years, but we've never actually gone after the format. So we are tempted to to take on the Rhino. We'd see what happens to us. Oh, a couple of Rhino fans there. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we're coming in on the end of the uh, time. Uh, Question panel, Andrea, Matthew, anything else you wanted to uh, chime in about? I don't have anything more to add. I see no, Matthew I was pointing people at the, we, we didn't talk at all about Civil 3D, but we do a pretty good job of reading Civil 3D. Matthew has dedicated part of his life to that. So um, that, that also is another place where stuff comes from and, uh, especially when it comes to infrastructure things, which I think we're going to be seeing more of. How about you, uh, Jovita, Dave, anything more we need to say? I think we covered it pretty good this morning. Uh, we want to save a little bit for our next webinar. Jovita? Oh, sorry, nothing from my end. Okay, well, I think uh, we will stop exactly on time then. And so I just want to thank all of you out there for tuning in. Thank you for, for your support over all these years. The BIM journey has been a long one and a hard one for us at SAFE. Lots of complexity for us to learn about and work on. And we know we're not done. And it's input coming from people like you that help us get ever closer to perfection, in quotes. Uh, I also want to thank our panel for getting up early and answering all the questions. And uh, it was a very um, interactive crowd. So thanks so much today. And especially I want to thank you, Jovita and Dave, for sharing with us today so much. Yeah, and I'll just mention quickly that if anyone does have any questions that pop up after the webinar, um, feel free to reach out to us on our live chat at safe.com, um, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. And likewise with the FME community, which is an awesome resource. You can engage with, with us there as well as other FME users. So you can find our community at safe.com slash community. Great. All right, we'll hang around just a wee little bit more in a silent way in case anybody else has any other things to chat with us about.
But otherwise, we'll see you in the same bat channel, same bat time in two weeks. And who knows my reference? Dave, do you know the reference there? Oh, I think that might be even beyond me. <laughs> Come on, Dave. Weren't you watching Batman in the 60s? I, I was a baby in the 60s. Yeah, I guess so was I. But I, when you only have one channel, that's about the only thing that was on in the 70s as well. So yeah, that's uh, true. Good old CBC. Yay. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks.